Welcome to the Writer Dojo with your host, Steve Diamond. Man, I've got no quote today. And Larry Correa. Hither came Conan the Sumerian, black-haired, sullen-eyed, sword-in-hand, a thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth, to tread the jeweled thrones of the earth under his sandaled feet. Today's episode, Swords and Sorcery, Round 1. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Rider Dojo. Glad to have you all with us today. Uh, again, as we're recording these episodes, these, this, some of these episodes, we are at Liberty Con over in Chattanooga, and we are uh, little by little grabbing people blindly, very much like a heist film, um, and, and just stealing people from the hallways. To get them to come interview with us. Yeah, we actually uh, shanghai Howard uh, Alpha Elevator just now. Yeah, we did. He was on the elevator. He was going down to, a, to the bar, him and his wife. And, you know, we threw a bag over his head and uh, ran away with him. And, and his wife was like, well, I mean... It's been a good day. It's been a good run, Howard. That's what she said. Something like that. That sounds just that sounds just like her. Yeah. All right. T- today's guest is Howard Andrew Jones. Um, we've talked about Howard on the show a number of times. Uh, he's one of he's for me anyway. Speaking for me, Howard's one of my favorite people on this planet. Um, we we met at Gen Con quite a few years ago. I think twenty seventeen ish sounds about right. Um, you know, one of the years in which I was moderating 73,000 panels. Uh, and Howard happened to be on like half of them. It was just the way it worked out. And at one point, I kind of look at Howard after like the fifth panel. And he looks at me and I'm like, dude, you're kind of awesome. And, and, and we just kind of said, like, let's just go grab some lunch. And so we did. And since that moment, like Howard and I have just been great, great friends. And it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show, man. So, I mean, man, just thanks for showing up. Well, thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for agreeing to let us, you know, abduct, abduct you from a, from I, I appreciate that. You know, Shannon actually has a second degree black belt. So you, so you were lucky. Well, I know. I mean, <laughs> I, that's what I'm saying. She was like, well, ciao. <laughs> She's like, it's just podcaster. She's fine. <laughs> so, okay. So Howard, um, introduce yourself to the audience here. And kind of tell us who you are, where you come from, and what you write. Sure. Well, I think you know my name. It's yes. Howard. It's Howard. <laughs> and uh, I came originally from Terre Haute, Indiana. And that's where I was born. Um, and I worked for, gosh, all kinds of interesting places. I was a TV cameraman for a while. I was something called a recycling consultant, mm. which means I worked at a salvage yard and tried to get people to bring in their stuff so that we could recycle <laughs> it. Uh, I, uh, taught, um, I taught English comp as an adjunct instructor, um, and I edited a whole lot of game hint guides in the 90s. But eventually, you know, I mean, I was always writing, and that's what I, that was my dream job. And uh, along the way, I practiced a lot of karate. Uh, along the way, I collected a lot of rejection letters. Hmm. Uh, along the way, I wrote a whole lot of uh, novels that I probably should burn so that no one ever reads them. <laughs> But, uh, you know, as happens, you get, you start developing some skills, and I finally started to sell them. And eventually, I landed a contract with St. Martin's, and I wrote a, a couple of Arabian historical fantasies for them, which are, they have a really strong sword and sorcery vibe. First one's Desert of Souls? Desert of Souls, yeah. yes, sir. And then I have uh, also written some Pathfinder novels. I wrote, I wrote four of those. Right. Uh, and then I wrote a sort of um, Zelazny esque. Uh, epic fantasy for St. Martin's, although I'd say that that's kind of on the sword and sorcery end as well. Sword and sorcery is one of my great loves. And so uh, when I went to Bain, I just wrote straight sword and sorcery, sword and sandal. You know, the heck with it. I just went for it. We're doing it. That's right. And so here I am, and I am so delighted to be here. Let me see. that. So that deal, it's a five-book deal, right, with Bain? Indeed. And that hit, I think that was made public last August-ish. Is that right? That is. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I was excited. Um, yeah, I, I I spammed that all over the oh internet when I saw that. That was pretty cool. I I because uh, like Steve, I've known Howard from Gen Con, and uh, we've we've had a lot of discussions uh, about his, your passion for the genre, and we we are both fanboys of uh, Robert E. Howard. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And we talked about that a lot. So when you when you got signed on with our publisher, uh, I was like, dude, that's cool. 
<laughs> I, was, oh. I was really pumped. <laughs> there, there was it, right around back, back around the July. I think it was July of last year. We were recording, and I said, "Larry, dude, you are never going to believe who just signed a contract with Bane." He's like, "Who?" I'm like, Howard. He's like, "No." <laughs> like we were high fiving each other. It was between takes because you know at the time it wasn't public knowledge. Um, but you know, we as authors at Bain also we kind of you know you kind of get the inside. Yeah, inside you, get scoop. The, you get the down. You get the down low. But man, we were so excited, dude. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm really curious. Where did your love of sword and sorcery spark from? Wow, you know that's a good question. So, in junior high, I'm still a huge fan of the original Star Trek. But back then, I was reading all the Heinlein juveniles and science fiction, all kinds of good stuff like that. Um, and then, do you know Appendix N at the back of the original Dungeon Master's Guide, right? Well, yeah. I was playing, <laughs> I, I was playing the original Dungeon uh, with the Dungeon Master's Guide, right? And so I read that, and I took my ten speed over to the public library and the used <laughs> bookstore, and I tried to find those books. Sadly, you know, the library didn't have too many, but it did have the Chronicles of Amber. Oh, yeah. Sure. So the original Chronicles of Amber blew the doors off my imagination. That's pretty close to Sword and Sorcery. That's a yeah. good gateway drug. It sure is. And the other thing that impressed the heck out of me was uh, the used bookstore happened to have what I still think is the very best of all the Lankmar books, which is Swords Against Death, the second one. And then between those two... I was sucked to my, well, science fiction is pretty cool, but this stuff is awesome. I got to find me some more of this, right? So, you know, then it was on to Elric and Corum. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I actually read the Corum books a number of times before I ever found um, uh, Hawkmoon or some of the other things. And believe it or not, I didn't get to Robert E. Howard for a while just because all I could find was the pastiche stuff, not the actual Robert right. E. Howard. And I wanted to get to the real thing. Right. Yeah, actually, because like in the eighties, there it was it was weird to find that stuff. Yeah, yeah, there was it was like a dearth of it. It like it had fallen out of print, and it was just like old copies. Right, right. You could find any other author who'd written Conan, right? Just, just not you know, just not the, the right guy. guy. Yeah. <laughs> just not in the fact, guy. Who in fact, it. my first introduction to Conan was uh, Robert Jordan. Yeah, covering it. Sure, there's like what six of those, and then the movie adaption of yeah. yeah. Until he went and, and then he went. That was just pre Wheel of Time, you know, mega stardom. But yeah, I remember some, reading some of those, and I was I was pretty young, and so that was my gateway. And I was like, wow, these are cool. Then I found the originals. So I was like, whoa, these are <laughs> these are way cooler. It's like I was like I was like I started with diet soda. <laughs> You started with Diet Coke and progressed to like the Mexican Coke. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or no, South no. South Texas Coke in this case. <laughs> <laughs> so for for our listeners out there, we we have quite a few who are up and coming authors, and we get the questions a lot. Like, well, okay, well, like for me, it's always like, well, well, what is horror, Steve? What is that? Okay, so for Howard, what is sword and sorcery? What is it? You know, I, that's a good question. Because there's debates about this all freaking day, every day. I, I just got out of a panel where this was discussed. And the problem is it's been watered down. It's been watered mm -hmm. down so much because so many games will slap uh, a new sword and sorcery game. And every reviewer who goes to a, any fantasy movie now says, a, a new sword and sorcery blockbuster. But sword and sorcery was coined by Fritz Leiber, the guy who created Fire from the Grey Mouser, to differentiate what he was writing from The Lord of the Rings. Mm hmm and therein lies another problem, because if you go to the cinema, they don't, they don't really feel that different. But on the page, sword and sorcery felt, feels very different than the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings proceeds at this slow, stately pace with a whole lot of details about food and pastoral things. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I dig Tolkien. Uh, but sword and sorcery was created for the pulps. Pulps were on the newsstands. They were a commodity. And so you'd wander past the pulp magazine stand, and if you picked it up and said, well, this issue looks good, let's see if it's any good, and you read a paragraph, it didn't pull you in, you might put it back. So these things had to grab you from the go. And so Old School Sword and Sorcery, created by Robert E. Howard, did that. Like a good hard-boiled detective novel. Mm -hmm. Pow! It pulls you in. The pacing yep. is immediate. And on you go. And I think more than just the pacing, it's also the fact that you don't have... You don't have someone uh, slowly learning to be better at uh, magic or better at their sword work. They're already a veteran, right? They're seasoned. They're ready to go. 
and magic is almost never a force for good. It's usually something dark and wild. dangerous and wild. Yeah. That's the other thing. There, are, there aren't magic schools and rules. Uh, it's usually something that uh, is really dangerous to mess with. Yeah, it's interesting because as time goes on, like the the line between where people would just call epic fantasy and what would be sword and sorcery, it, it just it, it gets weird. Uh, and there, there's some that like kind of cross cross the line. Like I've had people lump Son of the Black Sword into both, you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, and and it's 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 to me, I think it comes back to there's kind of a visceral grittiness. That's yeah, you know, it, it's um, it's the difference between like the polished knights and castles and, and and beautiful sweeping vistas, and the dude in the gutter, you know, you know, robbing a dude at dagger point and getting a cool. Oh, what? No, this guy's a master swordsman, and then you know he gets stabbed to death, you know, and through his body's thrown in the pig pen. <laughs> you know, a little bit of a difference there. Right, right. It's much more immediate. I, I like that visceral. Right. Yeah. It's it's blue collar. Right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That well, just like hard boiled detective. It. That's just like sure. the hard detective stuff is, right? Someone on the streets dealing with the, the real problems, not worrying about the people in the towers. Yeah, so the, it's like the hard detective. Is the, the thing that, and it's interesting that the, the Pulp share this because it was all about, it was like the common man. Yes. It was like there's that famous Chandler quote, you know, the down these mean streets, uh, about how the, the hard detective has to be a hard man, but a common man, you know, and he might deflower a duchess, but, you know, but, but he would never dishonor a maiden or whatever. There was there was that I, I'm butchering the quote, but you guys know the one I'm talking about, and uh, it's interesting because they both hail from the pulps, right? And who are the audience for the pulps? The regular everyman. dudes, the regular people. Yeah, right. Man, yeah, you, you can you can see why you can see why Larry and I are so excited to to have Howard here with us because it, it's it's one of the, it's one of the genres I really enjoy. Oh man, you know, I, Larry loves this stuff. I love this stuff, and and. Part of this is why it, I think it became so easy for for the three of us to kind of become friends over these well, things. Well, we've had on the show before, we had Dave Butler on the show, and he uh, uh, you mentioned Farford and the Gray Mauser. And so Dave Butler does his Indrajit and Fix, yeah. which is like his love song to, to that same thing. Where it's almost, that's almost like a like a buddy cop. Yeah, I think that, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like a, almost a buddy cop fantasy story. Uh, of two gritty guys handling the business on the mean streets of this ancient city. So how does your, how does your new series and, and let's, let's talk, I mean, name the names of the books and what the series is called and stuff. And, um, what, what choices did you intentionally make to say, this is freaking sword and sorcery? Okay. Well, the first one is called Lord of a Shattered Land. And that comes out in, that comes out in August 1st. Oh my gosh. That's just around the corner. And book two, one two punch, October third. Nice, right? Oh, one after the other. That's yeah. that's good. That's speedy, right? So, you know, the elevator pitch is sort of James Bond or Captain America versus the Roman Empire, or the adventures of Aragorn if Sauron had won. Oh, I like that pitch. Yeah, that's a good pitch. Well, yeah. I mean, that that appeals to me as the. Yeah. As the author that I am, so uh, <laughs> both of them get sort of sort of part of the way there. I just uh, I just read a review the other day that I, I quite liked, and they said it's kind of like if um, it's kind of like the Prince of Egypt if Moses were played by Denzel Washington's version of the Equalizer. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. And then he and then he added, and the burning bush doesn't give a damn. It's like. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's because Hanovar is hard up against it, right? Uh, and so here, here's the full pitch. You want you want to hear the yeah, full oh, thing? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, As they say on Psych. Come right, on, son. When the Durban Empire came for the city of Volanis, the people fought block by block, house by house, until most of them fell with sword in hand. Only around a thousand survived to be taken away in chains. The Durvans looted the temples. Well, they set fire to the temples. They looted the treasuries, mm -hmm. set fire to the temples, and they sowed the ground with salt so that nothing would ever grow there again. Their destruction was complete, but they overlooked one small thing, and that's that the greatest Volani general had escaped alive. And against the might of a vast empire, Hanover has only an aging sword arm, a lifetime of wisdom, 
and the greatest military mind in the world bent upon a single goal, no matter where his people have been taken, from the furthest outposts of the empire to its rotten heart, he will find his people, every last one of them, and he will set them free. Mm. Oh, that's wicked cool. That's freaking rad. Yeah. Mm. So that's the thing, right? And uh, I've structured it. Uh, it's a little bit more old school in its construction. So each novel so far of the three uh, has 14 stories, and each of them interlocks. It's like a modern TV series. So you could come in and watch like episode five and it would make perfect sense, but it's much better if you've read the ones preceding because characters will return. Uh, you find out more and more secrets and backstory as you go. And then each book ends with basically a season climax, All right? And book two, of course, builds on book one and book three builds on book two and it's building on toward book five. Oof. I really want it to build toward book six and seven, but we'll see how the first five do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break because um, if we don't, we'll we'll just keep talking about this stuff forever. So we we have to take a break. We'll be right back. Los Angeles, the 1970s. Disco is king, and the nightclubs are full of young, beautiful people with Saturday night fever. From the Sunset Strip to Hollywood Boulevard, a new era is dawning. But below the glitz and glamour, a terrifying darkness lurks. Chloe Mendoza knows darkness. She is an Agwali, a half-demon created by the gods of Central and South America, a child of the Court of Feathers, a group of demigods who ruled Mesoamerica with a bloody fist before the Spanish arrived. Now she is a member of Monster Hunter International's newest team. Business is booming in the City of Angels, but soon Chloe gets a message from the Court of Feathers warning her of a mysterious Dark Master who is building up its power in the region. Whatever it is, it brings death and carnage with it. Time to boogie. On sale now, set in Larry Korea's best-selling Monster Hunter International series comes the electronic advanced reader copy of Monster Hunter Memoirs Fever by Larry Korea and Jason Cordova exclusively from Bain Books. Hardcover available October 2023, anywhere Bain Books are sold. All right, we're back uh, for a little bit of round two action with our guy, Howard Andrew Jones. Uh, Howard, I, I found this, in, I found, I, I, on my way here to this con, I was reading, um, I was reading some horror stories, the, the collection of horror stories of Robert E. Howard. I was reading Worms of the Earth. Um, oh, that's a good one. I got that awesome on audio. Story. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's good. And and I was thinking about this because I knew we were going to have you on the show. And I was thinking about me being the horror guy, primarily you being the sword and sorcery guy. I'm like, okay, well, what is the difference between these two? And I don't know. I don't know if I read this somewhere. I was very tired. Maybe I even read it in the same collection. But basically, it said, okay. For horror and sword and sorcery, here's where it diverges. When the, when, when the character is presented with the crazy and the weird. In sword and sorcery, that's when they man up. In horror, that's when they go nuts. And so I, I'm curious as to, in your experience, how, how can people, how can our, our, our readers, our authors out here who want to write stuff, how can they tread this fine line between what's what's horrible, what's horrific, but man, what's sword and sorcery and what's heroic? That's a really good question. It's funny because horror has such a strong presence in sword and sorcery, and I love sword and sorcery, and I've read really obscure stu older stuff, right? But I haven't explored horror nearly as deeply, and I, I wonder if it's maybe I get all the horror I need reading sword and sorcery because it's all over there. These guys have to fight, and gals, have to fight terrible awful things, right? I mean, just described really very detailed. Um, well, let's look at one of the oldest differences we have, right? Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard mm -hmm. were pen pals. Yeah, they were bros. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the few times, uh, maybe the only time Lovecraft ever left the region was to come to Robert E. Howard's funeral. They actually spoke at it. Uh, you look at a Lovecraft hero... And like you said, he kind of goes nuts. You look at a Howard hero, 
He mans up and he gets the job done, even if it's freaking him out. He finds the strength and the courage to move forward. It's like recognizing that you have the fear. It's okay to be afraid, but you still have to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, <laughs> I, I guess the simplest explanation is man up. <laughs> it, it's interesting because that that collection, I love that collection, and it's got the other uh, the the mound story. I'm trying to remember what that one's called. Do you remember the one with the cowboy and there was the ancient burial ground? Oh my ground? god! Yeah, I remember Old Garfield's heart. What is? Is it just horror of the mound? Yeah, horror of the mound. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and it's interesting because that is a cowboy story, but it's a cowboy horror story. But it is the most sword and sorcery story ever. <laughs> And it's interesting because I, I think the difference between Lovecraft and Howard, and this is really kind of like godfathers of the genre, where they diverge is one had a very New England, like upper crust or respectable New Englander reaction to the to the stimuli. And the other one was the Texan cowboy reaction to the stimuli. It was actually just kind of a cultural difference. And, and from that, we diverged two radically different genres yeah. with the same... The same thing. I, I was like uh, talking about the, the the horror of sword and sorcery. It tends to go dark. You got human sacrifices, evil death cults, um, uh, graphic violence, horrible monsters. Right, and and you know, we've seen so much watered down Conan and Clonans. We always think that uh, Conan wanders in and he whacks the head off the monster, he rides off with the babe. And of course, the stories are a lot more. Uh, a lot more involved than that, and that doesn't really describe them very well. But there's one, um, I believe it was retitled The Slithering Shadow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in that one, he faces this monster that just kicks his butt. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even slay the monster. All he can do is hold the monster off for a little bit, and then it slithers away wounded. You don't even always defeat the monster in Sword and Sorcery, but you make a stand. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting the, the stuff that that hits, and it, it goes back to that pulp, uh, that pulp vibe. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Whether you back in those days they had the very Indiana Jones style, you know, Indiana Jones grew from that like adventure uh, into the unknown wilderness kind of thing. You know, and sword and sorcery would do the same thing when it was in the ancient world or or a different world, but it was the state hit the same kind of tropes. You know, and the same kind of interesting things. And I just find it fascinating that all these pulp things have, like, all this commonality. And for guys like us nowadays, we're still drawing on those same loves and those same interesting things. Uh, only we're doing it more in long-form fiction that these guys didn't get the chance to, to really explore as much. Yeah, yeah. And we can make our interconnections more, more deeply than they were ever allowed or capable of doing. Well, they were perfectly capable of doing it, but they couldn't have done it in the publishing uh, era of the time. Oh gosh, I mean, you read, say, Scarlet Citadel, right? Yeah, yeah. And you're reading that and you're going, this is pretty rad. Yeah. You know what would be even radder? If it were like twice as long. Yeah. I mean, think about that whole story that, you know, the capture of him and escaping the eldritch things, the giant freaking snake. And he's going through this whole process and you're like, but it happens so fast. And, and, and I remember the first time I read that, I thought, Oh my gosh! If this this could have been a hundred thousand word novel, and it would have it would have explored this so oh, well. Yeah. Oh my it, gosh! If they had if they if they'd been given the opportunity, they were perfectly capable of pulling it off. Absolutely. But the capability was not there on the publisher's side. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would have happened if Hour of the Dragon, Robert E. Howard's only novel, was actually taken by that English company that he wrote it for? Would we've had a whole series of Conan novels? We can only we can only dream, you know? We didn't get that. that that's just not our reality. I'd like to think that there's some parallel universe that uh, we could slide over in. Oh, my gosh. Pull down a big lung. I think this reflects what we talked in the first half, too, about like people talk about the difference between epic fantasy and, and sword and sorcery and where the, where the cutoff is, right? And I think part of the cutoff is kind of arbitrary because if you look at like where the genre comes from, if they'd had more chances to, to, to evolve their stories into longer formats... We probably would have seen more of that big world building. I mean, you wouldn't have seen the language stuff. That's why when people ask me the son of the which one is son of the black sword, well, it's kind of both. I do the epic fantasy, big sweeping storyline, world altering events, but at the same time, it's the nitty gritty veteran hero. You know, in this case, fantasy judge dread. Yeah. You know, um, and and I think it's because we now have the ability to write longer books, five book series. You know, fourteen episodes per book. That's awesome. 
you know, and so we get a chance to tell bigger stories that these guys didn't get in the olden days. Yeah. Mm. So how are you, how do you tackle this, Howard, when I'm curious, do you, do you come with, I ask this question pretty much of everyone who comes on the show. Do you hit it from a character centric focus first? Uh, is that the first thing that comes to mind when you're creating your these stories in your world? Is it the character that comes to mind first? Or is it like a setting? Well, I love this character. So um, I'm always thinking about new angles on him. I, you guys are probably fans of Batman the Animated Series, mm -hmm. right? Yes. That was so, really good. It's yeah, really good. It's really good. And one of the great things about this is the way my son's actually the one that pointed this out to me. Uh, he said, you notice how some of the best episodes, the villain shows a Batman if he was twisted slightly different or uh, allows a different aspect of Batman or Bruce's Wayne personality to get uh, emphasized. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really insightful, Darian. Nicely done. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think about him like that sometimes. I, I think about, well, how could I, what element can I introduce to show this aspect of his personality? So... But, you know, every one of them slightly different. So sometimes I get an idea for a place. Sometimes I get an idea like, oh, that's an interesting thing that could happen. And I base it around an incident. But I think one of the most important things is I want to tell stories that only happen to this character. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, sure, maybe a story like this could happen to another character, but it would only go down this way if it happened to Hanavar. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could get you could get a great sword and sorcery story that could happen to any sword and sorcery character, but I think you get an even better one that can only happen to this character, right? I mean, how much cooler is a story that only Elric could go on because of his specific circumstances, or only is going to happen to Fawford and the Grey Mouse, or only Conan could tackle because only he would handle it in this way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, if your character is distinctive enough, I think that's where you get a lot of power and interest. Mm. So, nuts and bolts. What do you do to grab a hold of the reader's attention? You know, in the tradition of the, you know, the pulp and the in, in sword and sorcery and stuff. What are the tools that you use to grab those dudes? Get you know, get your hooks in them in in those readers as quick as you can. Well, I love that old style pacing where it doesn't slow down and give you the backstory up front. You know, some of those great old Westerns and detective novels that we were talking about over yeah. the years, uh, one of the things that they do is if there's some really important backstory, they you just find that out as you go. You get enough to know what's happening right now and it's important. And if there's an important backstory, well, then by God, eventually, instead of throwing it all in the front and having to slog through it, it becomes eventually you're like curious well, what, what really happened? What's going on? And it actually is useful as a hook to pull the reader forward, right? But I also like the more streamlined prose style of that older stuff. And that's not to say that I'm not in favor of some, you know, some really alliterative language with some metaphors and similes because God knows Robert E. Howard and Fritz Leiber could really throw that stuff down. But they were also direct, direct through lines, direct action. And they didn't spend a lot of their, man, I hate it when heroes spend a lot of time in their head whining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And none of that crap. Yeah. Uh, the whiny hero is kind of the antithesis of, 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 of this, you know, because they don't, they're not going to, they're not going to sit there and be emo about it. They're going to handle their business. Right. They're, you know, cowboy up, kill it, get paid. Right. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. uh, and party on. You know, it's interesting to talk about like the, the just enough information to keep you going, but not to ever bog it down. You know what actually does this? And it almost fits the pulp mode totally different. But John Wick, the John Wick franchise, oh, does yeah. that. It has yeah. actually elaborate world building that it never stops to explain until it needs to. No, yeah. that's the, uh, yeah, and you can certainly see like a, a clear through line from some of the uh, some of the noir and the hard boiled stuff straight through to John Wick, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The 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 uh, the manly hero taking care of business. He he has been wrong, done wrong somehow, and now must you know go out and and well, do I mean, his thing. He ain't gonna make it right. Yeah, and he he might suffer, and it's nitty, and it's gritty. It's just interesting because we're talking about this. Because I watched the fourth movie on the airplane on the flight so out to Olympic. <laughs> really? I hadn't seen it yet. Me it was neither. Great. And it's just it's funny that we were saying this, and I'm like seeing parallels going back to basically the pulp thing, and I'm like. Okay, well, I, I see the parallels there. Interesting. Yeah. 
Oh, my goodness. Have you guys read the uh, Parker novels by Westlake, writing as uh, Stark, Richard Stark? I haven't. Oh, my God. Those a things are awesome. A long time ago. Yeah. There's been a bunch of film adaptations over the years, uh, but the original Parker novels, yeah, they very much had that that vibe of, of, of the... Uh, it's the it's the it's the lone hero down these mean streets gonna do what he's got to do, you know. And it had definitely had that vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they they had these awesome opening sentences like uh, uh, when the phone rang, Parker was in the garage killing a man. Period. I mean, that's the opening <laughs> sentence. Like you're gonna keep reading with a sentence oh, like yeah, that, absolutely. right? You got Good you got line. your choice at that point. Come on. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating that the, the, the inner, the inner, how these these different things are related. Um, so Howard, uh, so how much, uh, how much world building did you do for like the the distinctness of this universe? Like like what's the universe like, and and how much uh, like like uh, research did you put into that? And uh, what were you going for? So I was accidentally researching this since I was about sixteen because I was a huge fan of Hannibal of Carthage. I, I oh. read this Hannibal biography by Harold Lamb, one of my heroes, um, when I was 16. And Harold Lamb was not my hero at the time. I read this great biography by him. I was like, wow, this is awesome. So I became a fan of Harold Lamb and Hannibal. But anyway, um, this is a little bit like Hannibal of Carthage with the serial numbers filed off because this guy's this brilliant general uh, saving his people. I find Hannibal fascinating because he wasn't, he wasn't one of those... Um, so many of the ancient generals, yeah, they were awesome and fascinating, but they were all about the conquest. And Hannibal usually gets lumped in with them. But he wasn't really out to invade Rome to conquer Roman territory, like Alexander the Great moved on, or Genghis Khan, or Caesar. His was more like a war of independence. He knew that he had to stop the Romans, or his people were doomed. He meant to fight them to a standstill, and then get some peace terms. And it, it never worked out that way because the Romans were too resilient. But the, also the guy was brilliant. Almost Zoro-like abilities. I, I'm sorry. I've gone off on a tangent because Hannibal's so <laughs> freaking cool. No, go for it. No, but if that's your inspiration that you run with it, by all means, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I kept reading about Hannibal and the Second Punic War and the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And that's the seed of all this. This really has... a uh, ancient Mediterranean vibe, and the bad guys are very much a sort of a, a Roman analog. But of course, dark magic and monsters are real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. gotta That's, be. Yeah. It's interesting, because the last interview we did, uh, Mike Master was talking about Boudicca. Oh. <laughs> and so we've come yeah. back to... I know. We're right back with Rome again. Yeah. <laughs> In the best of ways. <laughs> yeah, it's really... But it's interesting, too, the, the, the different directions that different authors will take. Oh, yeah. With the same, you know, just fundamental building block of like Romans as the antagonists. Well, and, and as we mentioned in, in that previous interview as well, I mean, we've had Christopher Rocchio on the show. And his is very much the space Romans. Romans. The protagonists. Yeah, space Roman protagonists. Yeah. You know, and it's because he, he also is, is a massive... I mean, I feel like everyone we're getting on the show... I mean, maybe it's just a requirement now. If you want to be on the show, you have to be a fan of like Roman history. <laughs> Maybe that's just what the requirement well, is. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta brush up on my history. <laughs> there's so many centuries there with great stories, right? Well, you got a thousand year run. You're gonna have some good. You're gonna have some good material to yeah, draw on. Yeah, yeah. All right. To to wrap up this episode, I mean, we could go on for for hours and hours and crap. I mean, we haven't even. We're gonna have to get Howard back on to talk about like Poulton, like like detective noir oh, stuff. Oh man, I, because yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Howard and I, we. We talked about this endlessly at Gen Con last year. And oh, we went out one episode. We went going off almost the entire episode about just the collection Hills of Homicide. Uh, oh, yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. yeah the Moore. Yeah, because people don't realize Lou Lamore wrote oh, hard-boiled yeah. detective fiction, too. Okay. Sword and Sorcery. Um, we, we've mentioned some of the the big dogs, you know, in, in, in the genre. But one of the things that I've learned about Howard is, and, and you mentioned this at the top of the show, you've actually read a lot of the more obscure stuff. So for our readers out there, look, they, they know they need, they should be reading, if they want to do Sword and Sorcery, they should be reading Howard, of course, you know, um, Moorcock and, and, and all these things, right? Who are some of the ob more obscure authors that they, that, that would, that would really kind of um, wet their whistle, so to speak? Well, I got to tell you, Charles Saunders needed to be better read. That guy created Amaro and those stories are awesome. And I really wish his career had gone better for him because uh, 
they're they're hard to find in print now. Um, I think you can only find them in the used market. Those are those are excellent. Um, I would have to say the Jack Vance stuff, right? Okay. Uh, and Jack Vance had some really cool stuff that Sword and Planet or even Space Opera mm -hmm. that's always good. You always hear about uh, the Dying Earth, and that's great. I mean, Kugel is not a nice guy. They're more comic stories than, uh, I mean, darkly comic stories with magnificent world building. But I like his sort of Sword and Planet, uh, Planet of Adventure, really well. And that one usually doesn't get mentioned. It's uh, four short novels, and they usually you can usually find them in an omnibus these days. And that one kicks butt, and I usually don't hear people talking about that one. If you dig, I think Sword and Planet's an awful lot like Sword mm -hmm. and Sorcery. It's just uh, the guy may occasionally have a ray gun on his hip <laughs> with a few shots left, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and instead of elves, you get some aliens. And <laughs> But it, it's so similar, and it's so much fun. If you dig the one thing, you're going to dig another. But maybe I should talk about some of the more modern guys, like... Yeah. Uh, I hear this Larry Korea guy has some really cool <laughs> He's shit, okay. right? Right? He's all right. And DJ Butler. Yep. And um, James Eng. Oh, he's really good. He's really good. Yeah, he was. Uh, I really he was, liked his stuff. I think he's been the most recent guy who actually writes Sword and Sorcery. Who was nominated for a, a real, a real famous award. He was nominated for the World Fantasy just God, mm. ten years ago. Yeah, he's uh, really good. Yeah, and there's the mighty Scott Odin and John Fultz. And, Violet Milan and a whole bunch of really talented Warhammer writers. And those guys don't get enough credit. They really don't. I think a lot of people aren't aware how awesome the Warhammer stuff can be. Both, and you know, some of the science fiction Warhammer is awesome too, but I'm talking about the Warhammer fantasy. So, like Clint Werner and uh, Bill King and Nathan Long. It's Nathan Long. So, I edit this Sword and Sorcery magazine called Tales from the Magician Skull. And Nathan Long uh, is writing authorized. Lankmar pastiche for the magician skull, and it's it's <laughs> those magazines are awesome. There's some there's so much good stuff in there, um, so much good, just like short sword and sorcery fiction in there. Oh my gosh! Where could our readers find that? Well, they can find it uh, on the Amazon. They can find it on the Goodman Games website, uh, and I believe. Hopefully, very soon, they'll be able to find it on the Bane website. I believe some, uh, some stuff's been going on behind the scenes. And hopefully soon, that will, uh, that will all be available to all the Bane readers. Mm. Looking forward to it. Oh, man. All right, Howard. Look, it's, uh, we could talk for hours. Uh, and you and I have talked for hours. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, unfortunately, you know, it's late. And, you know, we, we have to get our beauty sleep um, because you know we, we got to look good for the cameras tomorrow. You know all of our all of our panels. Larry's guest of honor here at the con. Yeah. He's got to look all purdy. Dude, I just I just run down the hall and get stopped over and over again yeah. as Bridget shoves me towards the next event. <laughs> <laughs> well, Howard, look, man, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. Well, this for, has been a blast. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for, oh, and, thanks and, for being uh, on. And, and this will not be the last time because uh, you're one of our guys, man. We love you to death. Well, thanks, man. All you right. guys are pretty cool. Hey, we, we have our moments, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. This is the Writer Dojo. We'll see you on the next one. Writer Dojo is Steve Diamond and Larry Korea. Produced by Jack Wilder and Bear and Hair Studios. Theme song, Word Mercenaries by Craig Naibo. New episodes come out every Wednesday wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can help support us by going to anchor.fm slash writer dojo, by leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on the Writer Dojo, email ads at writerdojo.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to questions at writerdojo.com. Hannibal's so frickin' cool. <laughs>